1 John 4, 7 through 11. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from who? For love is from God. And whoever has been born of God and knows God, anyone who does not love does not know who? Does not know God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because why? God is love. Verse 9. In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. So propitiation is a fancy theological word that means Jesus paid the price. You have a debt against God. You have a moral debt against God. It's a, it's a debt you and I can't pay. We offend God with our sin. And because of that massive debt, God could abandon us, but because God is love, he doesn't abandon us. He fixes our debt problem to God. And so Jesus is the propitiation. He pays our debt. He is, he is, he's been sacrificed on the cross for our sin, that we can have a relationship with God. That's what pro propitiation means. Verse 10. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, so God the Father, in his glory with their naked eye, with their physical eye. But if we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. The interesting thing about love is that nothing in all of our society or all of the world or all of history there is not one thing that's been more written about, thought about, sung about, wished for, prayed for, and not realized in a person's life than love. You know what the odd thing about love is? Is that we know it exists, but we don't really know what it is. Everybody searches for love. Rihanna searches for love. Kanye searches for love. Everybody searches for love. Everybody talks about love. Everybody sings about love. But yet at the end of the day, think about this. There's nowhere you go where you go, there is love, like a physical thing. Like love isn't a, a, a thing. The interesting thing is science can't find love. We live in a hyper-scientific world where if, if I can't, touch it, see it, taste it, feel it in a, in a sensical way, then it's not real or it's not legitimate. But the funny part of that is you can't test tube or microscope or megascope love. You have no idea what love is. You can't go and point and go, there's love or love is this thing or whatever. We just kind of go, I kind of know when I feel love, I guess. But love isn't a location or a thing, because if it was, you'd just go there. Hey, I'm, I'm at love. What do you mean you're at love? I, I reached love. And if you could go to love and just stay there, you'd be at love every day. Where are you? I'm at love. And you'd never leave. But the reality is, we have no idea what we're even talking about when we talk about love. Our society has zero idea. Is it sex? Is it romance? Is it this? Is it that? Is it when I just feel butterflies? But what happens when the butterflies all choke each other and die? <laughs> Did I fall out of love? We have a phrase, I fell out of love. I don't love you anymore. I fell out of love with you. We have even phrases that talk about this thing that we don't even know what it is. We can't even quantify it. So now we're going to talk about the foundational reality of your identity. You are built for love. It's so natural to you that you sing about it, you want it, you, you crave it, you beg for it, you go on the internet to try to find it. Humans are built to love. 
It's obvious. Even people that don't even believe in God believe in love. And it's not even science. You are built to love and to be loved. And I'm going to make this point to you today. The thing we're going to talk about today is so foundational that if you don't get what I'm saying, you will be lost the whole rest of your life in figuring out what your identity is. This is the starting point to figure out who you are. Number one, God loves. God loves. Now this, this might be a hard thing for some of you because some of us feel like God doesn't love us. Some of us feel like God hates us. God hates me. Whatever else is true in the world, I can tell you this, God hates me. God hates me, he doesn't love me. I mean, maybe he loves other people. Maybe he loves pastors because they're perfect and they just walk around on clouds all day and sing songs with a harp and fat, fat cherubs flying around by them. But I know he doesn't love me. I'm perverted, I'm wrong. I mean, even last night before I got up to come to church, my life is just a wreck. And I can tell you one thing, God hates me. Because this thing happened in my life, my kid is this way, or I've got this addiction, or whatever I can't get over. And I just know when God looks at my life, he just must want to vomit. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to correct you, ready? Some of us feel like God's out to get us. I'm going to help you. If God was out to get you, he'd have gotten you. <laughs> God knows where you live. God knows where you work. He knows where you go to play and hang out. God knows all things. God isn't looking for you like, gosh, when I find that guy, I'm going to light him up. It's not like a dad who's like looking for the son they want to punish. Where's John? Where is John? When I find John, I'm going to beat that kid's butt. God's not like that. He already knows. Listen, if God wanted to get you, he would have got you. The fact, watch, the fact he hasn't, he has gracefully given you another day to understand his love. God is not vindictive. God, it says, is love. God loves you regardless of how you act. God loves you regardless of who you are. God loves you regardless of your skin color, regardless of your socioeconomic status, how, even what you believe. God even loves atheists that say, you don't exist. God doesn't love because he feels love. God loves because he is love. And I want to help you. God doesn't hate you. God might not approve of your actions. God might want your actions to change, but that doesn't mean he doesn't love you. In the same way, as a parent, you love your child, you might go, you're a total idiot. But I still love you. Right? Even on an even on even imperfect parental level, we still can understand that for our own kids. Now think about it from God's level. Where God doesn't look at you and goes, gosh, you are jacked up. I just can't even deal. I'm out. I don't love you anymore. You know what? God loves you, period. God loves you, period. He doesn't love you, but. He doesn't love you if you're good. He loves you regardless. The love of God is so massive for you, you and I can't comprehend it. It's so a part of who we are that unless you understand God's love for you, you will never understand what it's like to really love at all. You'll chase after sex to have love. You'll chase after somebody to give you romance to have love. You'll chase after money to feel like you're loved. You will chase after everything this world goes, hey, you want to feel love? You think that, you know that feeling you have inside of you that's like, I got to have love. Then have this or X, Y, Z. This will make you feel love. And you get it and you kind of go, I guess I felt good for a minute, but you know, I'm just like empty inside. I feel like trash. It's the reality of the fact that you are not experiencing the ever-living, ever-loving love of God. God loves you regardless, and he never will stop loving you. That's how great God is. 
God's not out to get you. God doesn't hate you. God might not like your actions, but that doesn't change his love for you. He loves you. Not a pastor, not somebody else. God loves you. There's nothing like the love of God. People's love will let you down. God's love will never let you down. Because God is love. Did that help? I know I'm trying to, I'm trying to rearrange you know, 50, 60, 70 years of bad thinking, so you gotta, got to hang with me. Everybody ready? Here we go. God loves. Everybody understand number one? It's only two words. God loves. This is the beginning of the beginning of our series, so I, wanna, I don't want to lose you here. If you're thinking about donuts and, and lunch, just check back in. Ready? Here we go. God loves. Not super hard to understand, but super hard to absorb. God loves you. God absolutely loves you. I don't know how much more I can say it, but I want you to understand this. God loves you. He's not a dysfunctional dad. He's not a, 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 a God that's out to, to harm you. He's a, he's a God that's out to love you. Everyone knows love exists, but few know how to define it. The Bible speaks of love. Uh, the Bible speaks of God as love, and the New Testament's written in Greek. It, in the first century when it was written, that was the common trade language of the day. So Jewish people wrote in Greek. And so the Greek word in 1 John that uh, speaks of God as love is ag- agape or agapeo, which we get the idea of self-sacrificial love. It's like when a soldier goes overseas to die for his country. It's like because he, he's, he's called to duty, one, but number two, he loves his country. He wants to protect his family. He's, he's going for the love of his country. He doesn't necessarily, in the, in the heat of battle in Baghdad or Afghanistan or Iraq, he doesn't feel these butterflies of love for his country, but he's doing it out of sacrifice, knowing that he might give his life to love his country. So agape is not the romantic sexual love that we, the Greek word for that is called eros, which we get the word erotic from. Agape is different. Agape says, I love you and I'm willing to sacrifice for you. I lay down my own desires so I can serve you. That's agape love. That's the kind of love that doesn't say, you better impress me or else I'm not going to love you. If you're not impressive, I don't love you. Agape love says, you're not impressive, and I love you anyway. And that's what the word describes God as. God is agapeo. God is agape. God is love. He's that kind of love for you. Never ceasing, never stopping, all love for you. 24 hours a day, every day. Like energy, love has a source. Lights have a source. Energy has a source. Similarly, scientifically, love, though you can't feel it with your five senses, but you know it exists, comes from God. So when you walk out this door, you will experience something called the sun. It's a burning little ball in the sky. You know what's funny? Is I've never been outside our atmosphere. This is me leaving our atmosphere, I guess. I've never gone to the sun and touched it or tasted it or experienced the sun myself. I rely on somebody with a long lens camera or a satellite flying by to take a picture and send it back to me. But guess what? I could be being lied to. I don't even know if the sun truly exists the way I see in pictures. It's totally on faith that I believe the sun looks like it is in pictures. I've never been there. I don't know. I could be totally being lied to. But guess what? Regardless of what I believe or don't believe about the sun, I experience it every day. I could believe there doesn't even, the sun doesn't even exist. There's just a hole in the sky up there. I don't even believe there is a sun. But guess what? It doesn't even matter what I believe about the sun. It still blesses me every day. Isn't that wild? My belief about the sun has no effect on whether the sun exists. Yesterday, I was exhausted out of my mind. You know what I did? I went in the backyard, 
my backyard. I got my chair out, much like similar to what I'm going to do right now. And I was just out there in my shorts, and I'm like, you know what, God? I'm going to go in my backyard. I'm just going to relax. And the sun was shining down. It was so beautiful. My dog was doing nothing, laying there like he always does. I feed him. Speaking of love, I feed him and take care of him. All he does is take dumps on my lawn. <laughs> no respect. Can't even pick up after himself, but I, I digress. And so I'm, I was walking into my backyard, and I just laid down in a chair. And I go, you know what? I'm just going to lay here for like 30 seconds and just enjoy this sunshine. 38 minutes later, I wake up. I'm totally torched all over the front of my body. I wake up walking inside, and Ju my Julie, my wife, goes, what in the world happened to you? I look like a, you know, like a half-baked, you know, like French fry or something. And the, the funny part was is I went in my backyard, and I just wanted to go back there and enjoy it. But guess what? The sun affected me. Whether I wanted it to or not, the sun affected me. And it's the same exact thing with God's love. You might not even believe God exists. You might hate whatever God you think is out there. But guess what? God loves you regardless of even what you think about him. You might not even care he exists. He loves atheists. God's love permeates the earth like the sun permeates the earth. And it doesn't even matter what the little people on the earth think of God. Because God is love, he doesn't feel love. He is love intrinsically. It goes to the earth and it connects with his creatures. And the funny part is, is God doesn't sense love for roaches that are in your kitchen or your dog that dumps on the lawn. You know who really feels love? is people. People have a depth of love that the rest of creation does not have because you are God's best. God loves you more than he loves anything else in the whole universe. You are built to love God different than anything else in all of creation. Unlike physical energy sources, however, God's love can be accessed at any time, anywhere, as God is its ever-present source. Every experience of real love mirrors God's love, even for those who don't believe in God. People don't have to search for God's love. It already exists for them. God's love existed before there were people to love and a creation to connect with. God created people to love them, provide for them, and have a relationship with them. Humans have no true identity until they find their identity in the love of God. So I'm going to hit this ad nauseum because I want you to, I want to retool your brain. You don't have to climb a mountain to go find God and live in a monastery and go, I'm going to just absolve myself of sexual passion or of getting stained by the world. I'm going to go climb up to, to the Himalayas and figure myself out. You know what? God does not need you to change your altitude. God needs you to change your attitude. And your attitude is, God loves me. I don't have to impress him. I don't have to mutilate myself. I don't have to do things to myself to make up for my imperfections, and hopefully God will love me. God loves you regardless. You can't earn his love. You can't earn the love of God. Why? Because God is love. He, his love, his love reaches you wherever you are, whoever you are. God is love for you. You can't earn God's love. Some of us have gotten bad training. And that comes from maybe your home life, where if you didn't act a certain way, your parents didn't love you. Or dad left your family. And you grow up, growing up, go, what did I do to dad to make him leave? Was I not a good enough kid? Why did dad always hate our family? And many of us grew up thinking, I got to perform to have people love me. Maybe dad will come back if I'm better. And we, and we, we think in our minds, we come up in our, in our minds with this scenario of like, my actions equal love. We do that as men and women. Women have a deep need to feel 
wanted to feel connected, to feel loved, to feel like somebody cares about them. So women will give sex to get love, to get that feeling of connection. They will give of themselves. They will give of their bodies to get that feeling. Men are more than willing to help in that scenario. And so men will give the feeling of protection and connection and caring. Like, I care about you. I value you. Men will give that sense to get sex. So the transaction between men and women happen because people are looking for love. But they're looking for it, like the old song goes, in all the wrong places. We look for it. Oh, sex is the answer. If I have a good sex life, I'll feel that sense of, like, love. Nope. That doesn't last. Okay, well, if I have really good romance, then, man, it's going to be awesome. I'm going to just feel, I'm going to have that, like, princessy, I'm safe, and everybody loves me feeling for the rest of my life. Nope. That doesn't last. And so people are desperate to know what real love is. Our songs in our society are packed full of figuring out what love is, and no one can. You want to know why? Because true love doesn't come from people, or sex, or romance, or money. True love comes from God. Because why? God is agape. God is love. He loves you just the way you are. No song and dance. No impress me or I don't love you. No Let's have sex or you don't really love me. I mean, how many dads are out there with daughters? Holy cow. I mean, remember when that first boy came over to the house to, like, talk to your daughter or whatever, however it worked in your house? What are you doing here, boy? Why are you moseying up over here? You got some business in my house or something? I, I, I need my toilet cleaned way up, way up over here. <laughs> Dog took a dump in the yard. You can go pick that up. <laughs> you bored or what are you doing? No, Mr. Jackson, I came to talk to your daughter. Well, she's right here. You're welcome to talk to her whatever you feel like doing. <laughs> go ahead. You want to know why? Here, this is crazy. Our society is becoming all trans whatever, and like there's no distinction between men and women. Let me tell you the difference. Is you know it intrinsically when somebody comes to mess with your daughter. All of a sudden, there is, there's a distinction. There's not this homogenous blob of sexuality. All of a sudden, it's like, why are you here? This is my daughter. You stay 15 and four-eighths of an inch away from her. You want to talk to her? You can just hang out over there. You want to know why? Because women respond to the voice. Men respond to the eyes, which is why men typically struggle with pornography. Women, however, struggle with when people say to them, I love you. Gosh, you look beautiful. I'm pointing at a guy, sorry. Gosh, you look beautiful. <laughs> Not that you don't look beautiful. You look great, by the way. We're not that kind of church, okay? Listen. But the point is, is that for men, when somebody says something to you, for men, it's like, okay, cool. But for women, they take it to heart, which is why women attack other women verbally. Men, when men talk about them behind their back, they're like, I don't even really care, whatever. Did he say something? I don't even care. But women, it's like, man, that, that they take, because it's deep, takes it to heart. It's the difference between men and women. Women look for their identity in a certain way, looking for love. Men look for love in a certain way, looking for their identity. And ultimately, you will be empty in your pursuits if it's not looking for love from God. You must know who you are in God first. Then, as a woman, you don't get manipulated by guys. As a man, you don't get manipulated by beauty. You know who you are in Christ. You know you are loved by God. And you can make correct choices in your life. That's why when your daughter comes to you who's 15 and you're sitting down with her in the living room, and she goes, Daddy? Yes, daughter, I'm watching ESPN, but I will, I will mute it for a moment to talk to you. 
Daddy, Johnny wants to ask me out. <laughs> I didn't hear one word you just said, daughter. <laughs> no, I'm serious, Dad. I'm super serious. And you know what? I saw him at school today, and he said he loved me. Where does Johnny live? Let's go. <laughs> You want to know why? Because we know as dads that our daughters can be manipulated by what people say. Not our sons so much, which is why dads are usually hyper-protective of like what you, who your daughter hangs out with and the things that are said to her. Because we know she's going to look for love in a certain vein. We know it intrinsically. We don't worry about our sons too much in that particular area. They have, they have other struggles. But I want to make this point. You're a man or a woman. And, you ha- and whatever struggles you have, it comes from the identity that you're looking for in some other place that it's not correct. You're looking for identity in a person and what they can do for you rather than God and what he's already done for you in Jesus. Everybody with me? Might hurt some of your feelers, but that's just the truth. God is love. God loves you. You don't have to earn it. He's all good for you. You might not like how you act. You might need to change your, the way you act, but it doesn't change God's love for you. God's love permeates you in the way the sun permeates the earth. Number two, God loves you so you can love. God loves you so you can love. God loves you regardless, and now because of that love, we have to respond. Believers must build their lives off their identity in Christ. So if you're still in 1 John, go back a couple books to the book of Colossians. Back towards the front of your Bible, just a few books in front of 1 John. Colossians 3.3. Underline this. Colossians 3.3. I'm sorry, 3.2. Underline Colossians 3.2. This is beautiful because this is how you and I are to live. Set, the word there means like literally to put something down or to, to focus on. Set your minds on things that are where? Above. Not on things that are on what? The earth or below. This is going to be super simple to understand but hard to apply. The reason you and I lose our identity is because our focus is not here. We have lowered it to here. We're looking for people to make us feel valued rather than God who has, has said, you're already valuable. You're valuable not because he loves you or because she's beautiful or you got a nice car or you built a sweet house. You're valuable because I love you in general. I'm God and I love you. I built you to, to be loved by me. We, lower, we, we bring our vision down from God to stuff and we lose our identity. Set your minds not on things here but your ultimate focus has to be here. Because that's where your identity comes from, is from God. Not from stuff, not from money, not from people, not from sex, not from anything. Every, all those things have, its, have their place. Sex has a place. Money has a place. Doing well at your job has a place, but it can't be your identity. Because when those things go away, you lose who you are. Everybody with me? Nowhere in the Bible are people ever told to love themselves more (laughs) or find themselves, but the focus is continually to love God, serve others, and die to self. So this is the Oprahfication of America. This is the Dr. Philification of America, where it's like, Greg, what's your problem? You know what? I just don't feel, I feel bad. Why do you feel bad, Greg? I don't know, I just feel bad. You know what your problem is? Is you don't love yourself enough. That's true. You don't love yourself enough. You you know what? You're right, Oprah Phil. That's right. (laughs) I don't love myself enough. I can't believe nobody's ever told me that. I just need to do more stuff for myself. Then I'll be super happy. What have you been doing your whole life since you were an infant? Thinking about yourself. The reason you're miserable isn't because you haven't found yourself or done more stuff for yourself. The reason you're miserable is you've done too much stuff for yourself. You're built, the love of God should come to you and and out of you, to others. The way you find joy, friends, 
in, in, in your life, the way you find true joy and happiness and pleasure in this life is when you serve. When people just serve you, you are so self-focused that you become empty. Selfishness will drain your life. The reason your marriage doesn't work isn't because you need better sex or you need better romance. The reason your marriage doesn't work is you've given up on agape love. You've given up on self-sacrificial love, that I love you no matter what. My wife, I love you no matter what, my husband. And I will serve you even if my needs aren't met for the moment. Do we need to work on some of those things? Yeah, okay, but that doesn't take away my love for you. I serve you the way God has served me. I love you the way God has loved me, which is no strings attached. There, I just fixed your marriage in about 30 seconds. Send your checks and letters to the church <laughs> for that counseling session I just gave you. But that's reality. It's not about going, how can I make myself happier? Because you will never be happy. It's how can I serve God by serving others. You will never feel more joy than when you serve other people. You will feel the pleasure of God flowing through you when you serve others. If you just stop it at yourself, you will feel nothing but emptiness because you will never feel happy because you're built to love others the way God has loved you. Christians are saved to serve. The primary element of love from Christ is the desire to love through Christ. Serving is the spiritual motivation that fills a person's time and fuels their physical action. Every waking moment, everyone serves someone, either self, God, or others. The percentage of time a person focuses on Jesus, others, or yourself determines who they live to please. The fact that love can be chosen means love isn't primarily feeling-based, but rather action-based. Love doesn't just happen it has to be chosen. No one can say they just feel love, but not do love. The greatest understanding of a person's identity and worth happens when the love of God is manifested by those who know his love. Because sacrificial love is so rare, God is most on display when believers are most deferential to others. In other words, people will see God in you when you serve them. At work, you know that employee that works with you that you can't stand? They keep telling you that same lame joke every time. And you're like, oh gosh, Greg, stop. Stop. And you wish that either you or him would get fired so you could go to a different job or he would leave. <laughs> Guess what? God has put him in your life to make you more like Jesus. So what you say to Greg is, you know what? Greg, I'm so glad God put you in my life because it's working on my sanctification right now. <laughs> You're making me more like Jesus because I have to love you when I don't really want to. God has put you in people's lives to love them. You want to know why? Because God loves you. And because God loves and serves you the way Jesus loved and serves us, we are called to love and serve other people. Not because we feel it, not because it makes butterflies for us, not because it even makes us better, because God wants to change your life because how he loves you. And because he wants to change your life in through his love, he wants you to change someone else's life through his love as well. You and I are a conduit of the love of God. When you shut that off like a faucet, you actually stop the love of God from reaching other people. When you get self-focused, you shut the love of God off. And you feel no joy in your life. No joy. Because you're not built to hold on to the love of God. You are built to open that up so that other people sense the love of God and they see the real, true, living God alive in you because you are alive through Christ. You are alive to live and you live to love. God has built you to love, but not love so you can be served. Love so you can serve.